Hello again, everyone. It's Andy, the Analytical Preacher. Last week's podcast had to do with what the Bible teaches us about anxiety, what the scriptures had to say on the subject. And I actually had an interesting conversation with a young man. I I guess he was 26 or 7 years old, maybe, about that podcast. And he had some comments and he had some questions. Uh, He let me ask him some questions. And I actually thought the conversation overall was fairly beneficial. I think he found it beneficial as well. And so uh, he agreed that I could, without, of course, using his name or location or anything, that I could share the content of that conversation with a larger audience. Uh, Since this is kind of a part two, uh, sort of an unexpected part two, I don't want to uh, repeat a lot of what I said in the first podcast about anxiety, how the Bible defines it and how the Bible uh, suggest the framework the Bible establishes for us to deal with it. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you have not heard what the Bible teaches about anxiety podcast, uh, that you actually go and listen to it first. Because again, instead of repeating, I'm just going to kind of pick up right where we left off. I found it interesting. This young man had turned to the scriptures, he said at one point, to help him with some of his, uh, what he called, uh, worries and anxieties. And he actually uh, mentioned two Bible verses that he had found just by looking in the back of the Bible and looking up keywords like anxiety or looking up keywords like peace or happiness or worry. And he said he found two verses that really meant a lot to him. I didn't happen to include them in the uh, last week's podcast. So let me just read them for you real quick. Maybe you'll find them useful too. The first one is in the Old Testament. It's in the Old Testament prophecy book of Isaiah. And in Isaiah, the 26th chapter, In verses 3 and 4, you read the prophet saying this about God. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. And he said he also found uh, a lot of value in the New Testament in the words of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, Gospel of John chapter 14 verse 27, where Jesus says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So he said he found those verses to be very powerful. If he keeps his mind on God, if he really tries to build a trust in God, knowing that God is an everlasting rock, knowing that ultimately the vast majority of his existence will be with God in heaven, that he does feel like Christ is trying to give him his peace and that his heart shouldn't be troubled. But he said, you know, honestly, it's just not as easy as reading those two verses every day when I wake up. It's still a struggle for me. Anxiety and worry are just a real struggle for me and the stress that they put on me. And so we had some conversation back and forth. I asked him a couple of questions. I thought his answers were very telling. And so uh, let me share those, the question, the answer with you, and then and kind of the conversation that went around that. I asked him, when is your anxiety the worst? Have you noticed that there are certain days or situations or times where your anxiety is worse? And he said, oh, without a doubt, I can answer that question. It's when I am alone. He said, the more you're around other people, There's just opportunities for your negative thoughts to be interrupted, for your for your concern to be sort of redirected to whatever question the person just asked or whatever you're doing. So he said when he was alone, he really felt like it was his anxieties uh, were much worse. And he said he just kind of felt like he he, as he got uh, moved out of his parents house and was out of college, that he seemed like he spent an inordinate amount of time alone uh, compared to what he used to do. And I actually talked to him about, you know, God created us to be in fellowship. And so family is important. But I also asked him about church and said, well, I'm a religious person, but I've not really found a church where I've connected yet. I've been to some and so forth. And I said, well, God designed us to be in fellowship. And actually, it's a it's an overall secular trend in the United States that we're becoming more and more alone. I recommended he read a book. It's not a Christian book. Um, It's a secular book by a college professor, but it's a book called Bowling Alone. And Bowling Alone actually discusses how sort of the social fabric of America sort of breaks down. We used to 
have big family dinners on a Sunday afternoon. And then we had our bowling league and our kids had their scout troops. And we went to the pool in the neighborhood and all these sort of things where we had these social groups. And all that is sort of broken down as the title bowling alone would suggest, right? And it really sort of kind of tears at the fabric, if you will, of society. By, and it harms each one of us. Now, he did say uh, at one point, in this part of the conversation, I think, I think he was half kidding, but he was only half kidding. He said, you know, but sometimes being around my family actually makes my anxieties worse. So I appreciate what you're saying, preacher. But and I said, yeah, I'm not necessarily saying you have to spend the time with your biological family on Friday night having a big dinner, but you do need fellowship. And even more importantly than just joining a bowling league and hanging out with folks and bowling, you need fellowship really with Christian people. You need a church family. And so don't say, well, I'm a spiritual person and I read the Bible myself and I pray at home. No, no, no. If you're dealing with anxieties, I absolutely beg you, find a good Bible-based church and get involved at that church. It is amazing when we we strengthen our relationship with God, not just through the Bible, but we strengthen our relationship with God through other Christians and we build the social fabric that underpins and helps us. So it's more than just if I'm around somebody, they can help redirect my thoughts or interrupt my negativity. It goes way, way beyond that. The Apostle John, who uh, was one of the youngest, we think, of the 12 disciples, he wrote a letter uh, 50 years, probably 40 or 50 years after Jesus had uh, crucified and, and been resurrected. Uh, and in what we call the letter of 1 John, the very back of the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says this. Check this out. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy, his and theirs, may be complete. Let me make sure we don't misunderstand that. John says, the thing, I was a witness to Christ. I walked with Jesus of Nazareth while he was on the earth. I'm proclaiming to you that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Christ, and that forgiveness is found in no other name but his. Here's the thing. Our fellowship, that meaning current Christians who've already accepted Jesus as the Christ, our fellowship, the fellowship of Christians, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write these things, we speak to you about becoming a Christian as well, so that our joy, my joy, your joy may be complete. John is literally saying, if you want your joy to be complete, one, you need to be a Christian, but then two, you need to be in fellowship with other Christians. And the more Christians that you know, and the more you're in fellowship, with other Christians, the more your joy will be complete. So I agreed with him. His anxiety probably is worse when he's alone and that the Bible has a really simple answer to that, which is join a church family. You don't have to go to a big church. You don't have to know 50 different people at your church. You don't even maybe have to know five different people at your church. But if you have some consistent Christian fellowship, it will help make your joy complete. I asked him also, what do you worry the most about? What is your fear? Is it that you're going to get a bad medical diagnosis at the doctor's? He goes, no, no, no. My fear, he, he mentioned a few personal issues that wouldn't really be relevant to a podcast, but he mentioned a few personal things. But he said, really, his fears, and he felt like so, the, the fears, the anxieties of so many of his peers were about these big complex issues like the direction that America is moving in. And I'm not certain that me and this young man uh, would agree on everything political. We didn't talk about politics at all, but he said, I just think America is moving in a bad direction. And I don't think I'm living in a world that's as good as the world my parents lived in. And if I were to ever have kids, he said he didn't feel like he could bring a child into this world. But if he ever did, he didn't feel like that kid would live in a world even as good as he did. One of the reasons he said, politics. He thought the direction the country was moving was not very good. And he said, I worry about things like the devastating effects of climate change. 
And he said, I really just feel like it's going to make things worse in the future. So why study? Why work? Why try to get married or have kids if everything is essentially going to fall apart around me? I said, you may not believe this, sir, but the Bible actually has a verse that sort of speaks directly to that issue. And as we talked about it, and I read the verse to him, he he was a little surprised that this was in there. Um, King Solomon, who the Bible says was the wisest person who ever lived, wise because he asked God, will you please give me the wisdom as a king to to lead your people. So, so basically God said, yes, I will grant you the wisdom that you've asked for to lead my people. At the end of his life, King Solomon wrote a book that we call Ecclesiastes. You'll see it in the wisdom literature portion of the Bible, right? Kind of in the middle of the Old Testament there. And here's one of the things that King Solomon says. Say not, oh, I'm sorry. This is Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse 10. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. I mean, King Solomon is just kind of punching you right in the gut and going, look, I know every generation has said that their generation is now on the downslope. And how come theirs is the generation that's going to end up worse off than everybody else? And he's just simply saying, it's not from wisdom that you ask this. If you simply take a good look at history, you'll see that's, you'll see that every generation thought they were going to Hades in a handbasket and then they didn't. And you'll understand from wisdom standpoint, if you look at it logically, rationally, that's not happening. I actually asked him if he had ever heard of a couple of different books. One was called The Population Bomb, and one is called The Rational Optimist. He said he had heard of neither. I spoke to him a little bit about them. Um, the Population Bomb was a book that came out when I was a very young child. And the opening line of The Population Bomb book basically said this, The battle to feed all humanity is over. Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death. This is this is what the opening lines of the book said. And then they talked about no matter what we do at this point, no matter what humanity does starting now, nothing is going to prevent the substantial loss of life. So I grow up as a young child under this idea that starvation was coming because of overpopulation and that literally hundreds of millions of people were going to have to die to bring things back to equilibrium. But here's the thing. That didn't happen. And in fact, we produce more food now than ever before. And we produce more food than is needed to feed all the humans. Unfortunately, we don't do really good logistically or politically in always getting the leftover food to the hungriest people. That is an issue that uh, we should work on. But we waste food, essentially, on Earth now. It didn't get worse. The rational optimist, is, and, and neither one of these, of course, are Christian books. Population Bomb was a book, I think, by a um, biology professor at uh, Stanford. And uh, The Rational Optimist is actually written by, a, I think he's been a professor, and he served in the House of Lords over in the UK, a guy named Matt Ridley. And Ridley's point is just this. He, he kind of looks from a point of wisdom at history, and he says, yeah, every generation has thought everything was falling to pieces around them but it never does. And in fact, rationally, you would be an optimist if you take this view of history. And that's exactly what Solomon was saying. It's not, it's irrational that you think the world is going to fall apart in your generation. Every generation's thought it, it's not happened yet. So Ridley, not a Christian, not writing from a biblical perspective says, yes, but if you are rational, you will be an optimist for the future. I understand it doesn't seem that way. I mentioned on the last podcast, just kind of at the very end, you have to be careful not to get hung up on news feeds and cable news channels. Um, you have to be careful essentially because they're not there to serve you accurate information. I mean, just to be as blunt as I can be. News feeds and cable news channels, et cetera. You're not the customer. The big business that's advertising with them is the customer. And their job, again, is not to provide you accurate news. Their job is to hook you into a cycle of staying involved, watching and reading the news source so that the advertisers get more eyes on their advertisements. And the way that news, cable TVs and news feeds, et cetera, the way that they hook you in is almost always with negative information. Negative sales. If it bleeds, it leads, the news guys say, right? If it bleeds, it leads. 
you don't see a lot of good news stories. Every nightly newscast is about who was shot, who was carjacked, which politician got caught in a scandal, which business was price fixing, I mean, their customers. Everything is negative. If you want another book to read, if you're not uh, satisfied with Bowling Alone and The Rational Optimist, there's another book called The Power of Bad, in which a psychologist essentially, again, not a Christian book, a secular book, The Power of Bad, he talks about basically that negative sales and bad can hook us into a cycle. And it's unhealthy from a mental perspective to be hooked into that. So I think the problem is advertisers want the negativity out there. The big businesses need the negativity out there to keep you hooked to your cable news channel or your Facebook news feed or whatever it is so that they can keep you constantly looking at their advertisement. That negative information gets in your head and you become convinced that the world is falling apart. King Solomon and Matt Ridley say that's not necessarily so. I mentioned also before there are ways that we try to cope with our anxiety. When I say before, the last podcast, there are ways that we try to cope with our anxiety. When I'm really worrying about something, there's nobody around to talk to or nothing else to get involved in. We do things like play video games, maybe on our Xbox or maybe on our iPhone. We play video games or we gamble. Online gambling's become really easy now. Or we do drugs because smoking a little pot really kind of takes the edge off, if you will. But the problem is, while those things seem very appealing in the short term, and these little OCD-type repetitive behaviors that we do, video games, again, gambling, drugs, whatever, they do seem to soothe us in a very immediate short term. The problem is they make our anxiety and even our depression worse in the intermediate and the long term. If you need yet another book to read, I read a book called The Dopamine Nation that sort of explains the physiological cycle that we get in with things like video games and yelling at cable news channels about how horrible the politicians are or um, pot and things like that. So be careful how you try to soothe these bad thoughts. And so I, I redirected him to another issue. I said, you know, actually that same person, King Solomon, and that same piece of wisdom literature, Ecclesiastes, he speaks about this idea of why you're worried about these big picture items like climate change, etc. And this is what King Solomon says, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. I have seen the business, Solomon writes, that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he, so that man, cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So I said the feeling about concern about the future, wanting to play a part in making the future better, wanting to play a part in being involved in something bigger than yourself. Does that interest you? And the young man said, very much so. I said, that feeling to be involved in something bigger than yourself actually comes from God. It is God that has put eternity in the heart of human beings. That feeling comes from God. God's answer, and again, this ties in with the last podcast, God's answer is, don't worry about whether climate change is going to kill all the elephants in 150 years. Worry about the things that you can actually control today. So the real eternity that God puts in our hearts has to do with his kingdom, with the gospel and with his church and with serving people in his name. And so I highly recommend it to him. Get involved in some Christian charity organizations where you help people, you help young kids read or you help single parents with their issues or you work with the poor or the homeless or things like that, showing the love of Christ and bringing the message of Christ to those people. But even in non-Christian ways, you still have that eternity. And if you don't fulfill it in a positive way, then you'll worry about it in a negative way. So I encouraged him. Yes, yeah, Solomon saw the things that God has given the children of man to be busy with. It just kind of seems day-to-day -day useless, and it's not fulfilling. And our mind then goes to these bigger, broader, longer-term issues that are bigger than us. And since we're already in a worrying, anxiety, 
sort of driven mindset, that's the slope we go down. I, I said, instead, come at it from a different way. Say, there are things that we can do. Take plastics out of the oceans. Rescue kids who are trapped in sexual slavery. Find an issue that touches the eternity that God has put in your heart and get positively involved in that issue. You will not be able to solve world hunger. You will not be able to solve um, sexual slavery all by yourself. You will not be able to take all the plastic out of the ocean. But find a way that God has put eternity in your heart and go work positively on that issue and then come back and tell me in a while, sir, if it didn't help you replace some of your long-term worries with some more longer term positive feelings that at least where you have control, you're making the impact that you're capable of making. I encouraged him to read that. Uh, why do you say the former days are better than these verse every day when he read his Isaiah and his John 14 verse as well? And then the one question that he asked me, he said, you mentioned in the podcast that if I'm too self-focused, it might feed my anxiety. He goes, I actually worry about that. And when you said that, it sort of, it sort of hit me as, okay, this might be a possibility with me. How would I know if I'm too self-focused? And I will uh, freely and gladly admit here, I am plagiarizing wholesale what I heard another minister say, but it's okay. Ministers, we agreed to let each other plagiarize each other's uh, information. So this is not my metric. This is another minister's metric, but I liked it. And, and that minister said this, how do you know if, and he was speaking to young adults and I was speaking to, like I said, a 26 year old guy. How do you know if you're too self-focused? And I said, I said, if I look at your Instagram, how many of your posts are pictures of you either exclusively just you or at least include you? And he said, probably if you scrolled all the way to the bottom of the page, 100% of the pictures would be just me. I said, well, maybe that's a good metric that says you're self-focused. I said, have you ever taken a trip with good friends? Yeah, all the time. Okay. Why aren't they in the pictures? Well, maybe one or two. There's all three of us are in there, but yeah, I would at least be in. I said, what about on Mother's Day? You ever put a picture of mom out there and say, this is the mom that raised me that I love. Da, da, da. This is the boss that did whatever for me. When you go to a place and the mountains are just beautiful or the waterfall is just beautiful, do you just take a picture of the waterfall and say, hey, for those of you who can't be here, Niagara Falls looks beautiful today. He said, no, every picture I turn around, I put my mug in it and I take a selfie with the waterfall in the background. And I mention something about how I feel as opposed to how beautiful. I said, well, then not to be too critical, but maybe then you are a little too self-focused. And so I will offer out to the podcast world. How do you know if you're so self-focused that it could be driving your anxieties? Take that Facebook, Instagram, TikTok test and say, if I look at your Instagram feed, how many of the photos are focused on you? How many of the comments are focused on you versus focused on someone you care about, someone that's done something nice that you were impressed with, a beautiful place that you've seen, a great experience that you were able to experience, etc. So try not to be too self-focused. Try not to get into these uh, coping uh, habits, these sort of uh, coping mechanisms, because again, they'll ultimately lead you down a wrong cycle. Don't worry about the big picture. Don't worry about things that are bigger than you. Find one slice of the bigger world and go get involved and positively impact that one bigger slice of the world and see if some of those things, maybe I think it was going to help this young man, see if maybe some of those things don't help you as well. All right, folks, that's it for this podcast. Uh, until next time, this is Andy.